Politics in the 70s is concluded tonight with another discussion between our four leading parliamentarians. Robin Day is in the chair. Welcome to the sixth and final programme in this series. With me again are Mr Reginald Maudling, Mr Enoch Powell, Mr Roy Jenkins and Mr Michael Foote. In earlier programmes you may have heard them arguing in pairs over some of the main issues in the politics in the 70s. And last Sunday you may have heard the four of them discussing the Labour Party. Tonight's discussion centres on the Conservative Party under Mr Edward Heath's leadership. How far has the party in government retreated from Conservative principles? What should Conservatism stand for? What sort of policy will enable it to win the next election and stay in government for most of the 70s? And may I start with you, Mr Mortling? What do you think uh, Conservatism should stand for today? Of course, when you're speaking on behalf of a party in government, it's a little different from last week when we were discussing opposition policies, and one's got to concentrate on what the practical problems are. I think the things we've got to tackle in the immediate future, or continue to tackle, are, of course, Northern Ireland, which is a tragedy for everyone. The development of our influence within the European economic community, but basically, really, the problem is inflation and the incomes policy. As you know, I've said already in this series, I believe the government are now entirely on the right lines in this matter. It's an exceedingly difficult problem. It will take a very long time to find a final or lasting solution to these problems. But unless inflation can be tackled, and to do so does mean effectively tackling cost inflation, then I don't think any government of any party can hope to make a very great success of things. But before I get on to particular issues, uh, mm. I would like to ask you about what conservatism should stand for, because in your answer you haven't indicated any sort of philosophy, except perhaps that the conservative philosophy should be tackling problems as they arise in the most sensible way. Is that in fact a conservative philosophy as you well, see it? Not all of it, but it's an important part of it. Not a bad idea to have a government that does tackle problems as they arise. You can't tackle problems that don't arise, and you shouldn't try to do so. But the basic philosophy of the Conservative Party, I think, is the one, well, exemplified by an organisation of which Enoch Powell and I are both members, called One Nation. And the basic philosophy of the party is that this is one nation, and the government should serve the interests of that one nation. In so far as power is bound to swing between one party and another, and therefore there must be a distinction between the parties, I thought the Conservative Party should always put its emphasis, first of all, on individual rights and duties, and secondly, on the maximum degree of individual liberty within the context of the necessary order for a civilised society. And do you feel that the present government is moving away from some of those principles, in particular that of individual liberty? with its controls on inflation and so on? No, I certainly don't. I've always believed, I said this, the first article I ever wrote about politics many, many years ago now, that you cannot have freedom without order. The purpose of order is to enhance liberty. And what I think the government are now doing is to pursue a policy using the necessary powers of government where that must be done in order to give to individuals realities of freedom. Does that uh, strike you as a useful summary of what conservatism should stand for today, Mr Powell? I'm sorry to have to say that I fail to recognize or at any rate to vibrate to nearly all of that. My fear is that uh, the Conservative Party is being led to destruction. Uh, not because it's uh, stood on its head and reversed and even contradicted so much of what we were saying in opposition and professed at the last general election. Uh, experience shows that uh, quite a good deal of reversal of engines can take place without the vessel driving onto the rocks at any rate at the immediately following election. But when the reversals relate to matters so vital to what that party is about, to what it has to say, and uh, I think we were on the right lines last week when we all agreed that politics have to be about principles, whether we are trying to appeal to a segment of the public or to the whole nation. Uh, at any rate, we are trying to appeal with a statement of principles. Could you say now, what the principles yes, are which you well, think are being betrayed or reversed? Well, I was going to. There is, first of all, the whole approach to the relationship between government and industry. The reversal of the principle that government is essentially a regulative force which lays out a framework within which 
private enterprise and industry operate, but not an interventionist force which says, don't do this, do that instead, which says heavy motor bicycles for export to the United States. That's what we want, not light motor bicycles by any chance. Well, we've done a great deal uh, of reversal in that field. One can't avoid the rubric of lame duck which has been placed over that. Then there's the consequences of the inflation, which if we didn't produce it, we did a great deal to enhance. Because, of course, not only did we, and I'm warmly in favour of this, make massive reductions in taxation, but we didn't uh, lay the only proper foundation for reductions in taxation, which is a reduction in the proportionate claim that the state's going to make upon the national income. Instead, at the same time, we were expanding that claim, and we've reaped the fruit in terms of inflation. And having reaped the fruit in terms of inflation, we have now imposed a system of control which not only is in contravention, so far as wages are concerned, of what we expressly promised in explicit terms over and over again at the last election, that we would not introduce control of wages by law, but a system of control which reaches down into the minutest details of the management of companies. And finally, and I don't want to make the list set out to the crack of doom, finally, I think the most fatal thing is not the decision to join the EEC in itself. That's a different debate. But the fact that that was forced through manifestly without anything like the full-hearted concurrence, either of the House of Commons or of the public, I think it is that above all uh, which has placed uh, and will place a great many Conservatives in an intolerable dilemma. Could I, before I ask Mr Maudley to comment on that catalogue of, uh, of offences by the present government, could I ask you to state what you haven't in fact stated in the answer? What are your positive principles for which conservatism should stand and to which you think people should vibrate as you did not vibrate to Mr Maudley? Uh, very well. Uh, it's partly implicit in what I said already. And the first is uh, that uh, the state holds the ring, that it lays down the rules and it constantly improves and reviews the rules indeed within which enterprise operates, but that it does not select, nor does it use its power of taxation to select what people shall choose to do within that framework. Uh, that's one point. Secondly, that by failing to exercise its control over money, which in the modern state is the creature of government, instead of once again creating an environment in which people can use price, profit and all the indices which are available to the individual to take their own decisions, it is sucked into managing everybody's life and business for them. Now, Mr. Maudling, before I bring in Michael Foote and Roy Jenkins, you have quite a lot to deal with there. In particular, I think the first thing is that the Conservative Party under Mr. Heath is being led to destruction. Well, that's obviously not true. Why he... obviously? Well, you've only got to regard the political facts at the present moment. It's not being led to destruction at all. The government to stand the way it does halfway through a parliament is a pretty considerable achievement. I disagree, as I think you know entirely with Mr. Powell, on the analysis of what causes inflation and how it should be cured. It will take a long time to go into that in great detail. But what I don't quite understand is when he says the present government are departing from the principles in economic policy which the Conservative Party should adhere to. Because I seem to remember fairly well the previous Conservative government that Mr Powell was a member of it part of the time. I remember particularly the policies pursued when I was Chancellor in 1963 and 1964. I see no difference in principle now between the policies I was trying to pursue as Chancellor and what is being pursued by the present Chancellor. I don't recall at that time Mr Powell was raising the roof in protest. But you didn't have uh, price and wage control in those days, did you? No, I was trying to get an incomes policy, though. But you didn't have compulsory no. uh, <coughs> price and wage control, which, as no. Mr Powell says, reaches down into the minute eye of everyday dealing. We were forced into a compulsory wage and price control because the attempt to get a voluntary system collapsed. And I've always made no secret about it. If you cannot get a voluntary price and incomes policy, you are perforce driven into a compulsory one even if it's only for a short period, until you can get a long-term solution. What about Mr Powell's point that the inflation has been partially caused by the government's own action? I just don't believe this. This is his idea. He's always been an adherent of the quantity theory of money, the pure, simple quantity theory of money. I think if you try and 
follow that policy, you finish up by compressing the amount of credit, the amount of spending power available, you finish up with stagnation, low investment, stop go, while the big battalions who have the power behind them in political terms continue to get wage and income increases greater than the economy can stand or can be justified. Would you like to comment, Mr. Powell? Well, I'd like to go back for a moment to the time when uh, uh, Reggie Maudling and his predecessor Selwyn Lloyd were chancellors of Exchequer and I was Minister of Health. I was quite clear at least I thought I was, uh, in what policy I was cooperating. Uh, and that is that the size and growth of government expenditure uh, had to be restrained. And during the uh, controversy over nurses' pay in which I was engaged, uh, I was not saying 2.5% is the right figure. What I was saying is I am not going to go to the Chancellor of the Exchequer and say I want more money for increasing the number of nurses that I can recruit at a time when A, I don't happen to believe that is what the National Health Service want most, and B, I recognise that the overriding requirement is control of the total quantum of expenditure. So there's no inconsistency there. Could I come back from the politics of the 60s, however interesting, <laughs> to the politics <laughs> of the 70s, and invite Michael Foote to say what has occurred to him as he's listened to this exchange? Well, uh, just to pick up, there is a whole of... A wonderful city to sack there, if you look at it, isn't it? But uh, just to start with uh, Reginald Morning saying that the government has brought to an end stop go. I don't know that there's any evidence that they've done so. There is a boom on at the moment. We all uh, know that. But it's a very peculiar kind of uh, boom, as far as I can see. That is, it's a boom in which uh, uh, some people, of course, a few people, are getting rich at an enormously rapid rate, particularly the property owners. A boom in which uh, land values go up by 100% in 12 months. A boom in which uh, profiteering is going on on a fabulous scale. But it's not a boom in which the general standard of life is increasing at anything comparably. And it's a boom in which uh, very considerable sections of the community are having their standard of life reduced. And that is why I believe that the real indictment of the government is quite contrary to what Reginald Morning says at the beginning when he talks about one nation. This government is deeply damaging the whole idea of one nation. It is wrenching apart the sense of community and uh, which, whichever way you take their policy, whether you take the original one or the one they're following now. It might be thought that because I disagreed with the original policy, if they reverse it, that I might like the one better. But I don't like them whether they're standing on their head or the, the right way up. Did you, did Either way, they have operated it for the same purpose, and although they talk of one nation, the reality is that they are driving greater fissures into our society. Did you vibrate, to quote Mr. Powell, to either of their statements of uh, conservative philosophy? <laughs> no, I thought that uh, the, both of them were engaged in the business of trying to conceal what was the real purpose of the operation, and that is to keep the Conservative Party in being and in office. Of course, Sir Reginald Morning uh, expresses that more clearly. He says, uh, pragmatism run wild is what he described, and that has always been the purpose of the Conservative Party. They've been quite skillful at it over about three centuries of keeping in office and discovering the means by which they can do it, whilst at the same time furthering the interests of the class which they think is born to rule. And that's what they're up to. So generally. in other words, you prefer Mr. Powell's Toryism, because at least that is clear and not a sort of well, concealed he's, power. He's effect. at least got a touch of the old Disraeli idea, and uh, that's better. That's where they got the one nation phrase from. But of course, even with Disraeli, it was only a phrase. Uh, Roger, can well, where Mr. Powell is uh, clearly right is in saying that on almost every issue one can think of, Europe, I suppose, only a part. This government has turned around like a squirrel in a cage since 1970. And that, I believe, has on the whole been a discreditable process so far as politics are concerned, and is one of the reasons for the very considerable disillusionment with politics that there is at the present time. Now, I differ sharply from him, because if I have to make a choice, I agree with Michael Foote to the extent it's a difficult choice, but on a number of issues, I slightly prefer the direction, the more sensible direction, which the government is now facing, and the very foolish direction in which it set out facing in 1970, and it's learnt a good deal from this. Now, Reggie Maudling, as I understand it, who's a great pragmatist in politics, really says all this doesn't matter very much. The important thing is never to raise an issue which isn't there to deal with issues as they come up. I don't believe this myself. I think the problems of political leadership, the question of political leadership, 
often involves um, presenting issues which people don't necessarily want to have presented to them. I don't believe that you never pursue any policy other than that of trying to deal with something which you can't avoid dealing with. I don't believe in this Baldwin-esque politics, which I think is not an unfair description of it. But I also believe that there is a certain more fundamental danger about avoiding the politics of principle. And I think to some extent one's seeing what's happening in the United States at the moment. If you get people unrooted in any political philosophy, if you get them believing in power and the exercise of pragmatic power for its own sake, and President Nixon and his administration have, um, have exercised pragmatic power in a number of surprising and in some ways externally particular beneficial ways. But I think if you just believe in exercising power for its own sake in this way, then you do get the difficulty of having these um, rootless people, um, such as have emerged in the Watergate in inquiry, without any base in principle or for standing for anything other than power for its own sake. Could I first of all say about Michael Foote, I think he's reputed to have said on one occasion in the past, he never liked to allow the facts to obstruct his arguments. And this has been a very good example, because the boom he talks about, that we call an expansion of our people, other inclinations, has led to a very large reduction in the unemployment about which he and his colleagues were complaining only a year ago. And so far as living standards are concerned, the simple fact is, as given by the Prime Minister a week or so ago in the House of Commons, that real living standards for the population at large in this country had been rising much more rapidly in the last three years than they were in the six years before. I agree there are a number of classes in the community still not benefiting to the full extent they should. That is a matter for social policy. And incidentally, the social policy of this government under Keith Joseph, I think, has been remarkably progressive. But let us at least base our arguments on some facts. At any rate, as for what Roy Jenkins has to say, what I said, what I didn't believe in raising issues that are not there. I didn't say I didn't believe in raising issues that were there but were inconvenient or obscure. The point I had in mind was I think the public are sick and tired of party political battles for the sake of party political battles, and people who love raising issues yeah, that really are not real issues. Mm -hmm. If there is a disillusionment, I'm not so sure there is this great disillusionment with politics and parliament, if there is a disillusion, I believe it comes more than anything else from the feeling in the public that we in parliament are merely arguing for the sake of argument because we love arguing and love the sound of our own voices. Could we w return to what we touched on already? Uh, Mr. Powell touched on it, uh, namely, and this is perhaps the most important current application of a, of a party's philosophy, namely how you deal with the problem of inflation. Um, Mr. Powell, are you saying that all the apparatus of control and intervention which the government has set up in an attempt to deal with this is wrong and should be swept away? And if so, what would be your solution? It's perfectly futile and irrelevant because it is based, in my view, upon a false analysis of the causes of inflation. It's based upon the assumption that prices rise because people choose to put them up and therefore you must tell them not to, and that wages rise because, curiously, after years of sleep, apparently, trade union leaders suddenly decide to go for 10 or 15 percent when previously they were going for 2 or 3 percent. I find this analysis totally unintelligible. And, uh, for 15, 18 years, uh, I have believed and stated, and I have acted upon it, uh, arguably to my own detriment, that it is the manner in which modern government uh, finances its operations, uh, and incidentally, and this is a subject on which Reggie Maudling and I have strongly agreed over many years, the management of the currency externally, because I do believe a floating rate or a fixed rate uh, have a good deal to do with this. It's complicated, but one must mention it for completeness. I believe that there lie the causes of inflation and therefore lie the cures of inflation. And that uh, we have classically and evidently in the last three years, by widening the gap between the yield of taxation and the outgoings of government, and if you listen to the present Chancellor of the Exchequer, you find him admitting this in many of the things which he says. We have provided the material for the rise in prices and the rise in wages, and we have then proceeded to blame for the consequences both the public at large and organised labour. Why do you say your cure, though, is necessarily more conservative than that which the government has attempted, bearing in mind that... All governments, including conservative governments, have tried something on these lines since the war. Well, clearly it's not conservative to detect 
the true rather than the false cause of an economic phenomenon. That I'm not claiming. If it is uh, a true rather than a false cause. Nevertheless, uh, I will admit that there are many respects in which the money to review of inflation, if I may use that single word, is congenial to the conservative view. For example, if as is characteristic more of a socialist than of a conservative administration, the view of government is in favour of the expansion of government, of public expenditure, then it is likely that they will be tempted to take the risk of financing that in part by inflation, by creating money and thus easing the transition towards an ever higher participation of a state in the use of the resources of the country. And secondly, of course, if you take the view, if you're driven to take the view, which I'm not, that inflation is caused by the individual decisions of people, what to charge for their goods, what wages to agree upon with their employers, then a system of control follows, which means that as government is controlling prices, government in fact is controlling and controlling in detail the whole economy. And that's what we're going to find as we endeavour to work out stage three. The corporate state, in your view, would that be? I have been guilty of using that expression in this context in its cleanest and most academic sense. There we have the, uh, the essence of the argument, I Mr. Think, Powell, Mr. Morley. Yes, I think the trouble with Mr. Powell's argument is he believes there is such a thing as a free market in goods, services and labour. There's nothing, of course, of the kind in modern conditions, certainly so far as the supply of labour is concerned. When there was a freer market before the last war, which is more, I think, in a tune with Mr Powell's economic uh, thoughts, then, of course, you remember the enormous booms and slumps and the massive unemployment that took place, and this country is not prepared to go back to that. Even if it were possible to go back to a so-called free market, people would not want to do so. And the market is not free, very largely because of the power of organised labour, which has become in recent years much more conscious, exercised, I think, in the main responsibly, not always, main responsibly, but is now much more conscious. And it is clearly within the power of organised labour, particularly in vital industries, to insist on large increases increases in incomes, which are so large they must inevitably put up prices and therefore further the movement of inflation. Mr. Powell's solution is to say, oh, well, the only thing you need to do is cut down the money supply. I've never said cut down the or money supply. Or cut down supply. government expenditure. No, no, I have never said cut down the money supply. What I have said is ensure that it does not increase faster than production yeah, sorry, increases. Yeah, we, we should cut the rate of increase at the stroke. Yes, I'm not in favour of deflation and never have been. But, but surely, deflation and inflation are opposite sides of the same coin. You can't have inflation. There's no such thing as a state of inflation. If you reduce the amount of money people have to spend, whether in no, public I or in private... I have talked about reducing if, the amount of money. If you reduce the rate at which the money is about advanced... It's it increased, fact, yes. That's, very, that's the opposite. Look, if you try and proceed by making sure that people have less money to spend than otherwise they would spend, then there will be less consumption, less investment, more unemployment. This is the classical way which is thought to be effective for containing prices and inflation, maybe through unemployment, deflation and cutting back on the expansion of the economy. It's been shown time and time again to be a total failure and in modern conditions had no chance. Mr. Powell? Well, I think um, that point of view would qualify the person who puts it forward for consideration for membership of some branch of uh, uh, a social democratic party. I simply can't recognize the demonology of the 1930s. In my view, one of the major causes of the slump of the 1930s was the handling by governments of money was the fact that the way in which they handled it actually cut down the supply of money and enforced the consequences which follow from that. But, Mr. Morgan, exactly that's what I'm saying. No, I have never advocated that. Uh, Reggie Maudling says that I propose that people should have a lesser increase in money to spend than they otherwise would have. But they always have a lesser increase in money to spend than they otherwise would have. The sky's the limit if you're in the business of manufacturing money. I simply say that as the state is capable of controlling broadly the rate at which spending power increases, it must do so so as to keep the advance of spending power broadly in step with the advance of production. Now, could I ask... Uh, another former Chancellor, another in addition to Mr Maudling, Roy Jenkins, to give his thoughts on the exchanges he's just heard. 
I think if Reggie Maudling has too little philosophy, you know, Powell has too much. <laughs> um, I think he erects, as I've often heard him do before and done with great skill, he erects a logical house. Who is this, Mr. Maudling or Mr. Mr. Powell? Powell? Nobody's ever accused Reginald Maudling of doing yeah. that. <laughs> he erects a logical house which is made out of gossamer in some way and has no relationship with the real world at all, though it's internally consistent, once you accept the false premises on which it's constructed. And what I find remarkable when I listen to Enoch Powell arguing about economic facts is we never hear any illustration at all. He says um, inflation depends to some extent on the proportion of resources preempted by the public sector. He never says, look at this country and that country, which has rather less resources so preempted and has rather less inflation. And this is true indeed of all his arguments. It's a totally detached argument in a little logical world, consistent within itself, but bearing very little relation to anything else. May I bring in Michael Foote at that point, whom I sense, I may be quite wrong, have been saying a slight impatience with some of the uh, stratospheric arguments he's been using here. Stratospheric? I, I would have thought it was the other way around. I don't propose to plunge into this bog of monetary theory in which uh, several others seem to be floundering. It seems to me what is absolutely clear is that there is going to be no return to the free market in the old form. And uh, the question is, where are we going to go if we're not going to return to it? I quite agree that we will be heading, if we follow the course we are now following, towards some form of corporate state, particularly because the present government has been so neglectful in trying to retain any parliamentary, effective parliamentary control over the kind of instruments that they are using to operate their policies, such as the Prices Commission and the rest, by removing them as far as possible from Parliament, they are making it more likely that uh, it will be a kind of corporate state that follows. Moreover, I don't believe you can have a situation whereby the major policies are decided in Downing Street in negotiations between the CBI, the TUC, and that Parliament is then going to be instructed to just lump it, because that also would mean a destruction of democracy. I think we've got to find a third course, that is, a, a new form of uh, political and economic democracy, to which I give the name of democratic socialism, but well, I know we're not going to convert... social no, democracy? Yes, it's a considerably more advanced <laughs> and coherent philosophy generally. I'm not trying to convert the these people here, I don't suppose we'll get them, but what I think is with the most uh, shocking aspect, if you like to put it that way, or the revelation of Reginald Maudling's mind on the matter is, he says, oh, people are sick and tired of party politics, you know, and the dogfight and arguing. Now, that is, of course, feeding the idea, not merely of the corporate state in their action, but the atmosphere of a corporate state, of people to saying, to hell with politics and political argument. I think he should learn a bit more from uh, Disraeli, from whom he pinched the phrase about uh, one nation, because Disraeli said, uh, above all, maintain the line of demarcation between parties because it is only by the maintaining the independence of party that you can protect the integrity of public men and the power and influence of parliament itself and so therefore i believe it is extremely important that we should kill this idea that arguing about party politics is in some way debasing it is the only way in which you can maintain a healthy democracy in this country what do you say about that? Because I noticed also that Roy Jenkins agreed with you when you said uh, the public were sick and tired of certain types of political argument. I think the answer is this, that of course you must maintain the distinction between the parties where it is a real one. What the public are sick and tired of is argument for argument's sake. And I think they feel, and I agree with them, there's an awful lot of argument that goes on, even some of the argument amongst ourselves this evening, does take the form of scoring points off one another, not trying to arrive what is the best solution, but the maximum common agreement you can get. I believe in trying to get as much done by agreement as is possible. That is why I believe in the economic field, the government are right to try and proceed with the agreement, as far as they can get it, of unions and employers. Because the only alternative to agreement is conflict. I do not myself believe that conflict is normally constructive. I do not believe in conflict unless conflict is necessary. You, conflict you, for its own sake, I think, is a great mistake. You stand uh, for the what is called... Uh, uh for convenience, the consensus approach to politics. Well, that phrase, like the corporate state, I don't like these phrases, but if you mean 
Do I think it's common sense to agree with other people rather than fight? And the answer is yes. I don't want to lose a very important point made by Enoch Powell earlier in, in the course of his diatribe against the, where the Conservative Party was going wrong at the beginning of the programme. And that was, he said, in not merely in taking us into the common market, but in taking it in by a procedure which, and I summarise, not quote, contemptuous of the democratic process. Uh, Reginald Maudling, you haven't dealt with that point, and I think you ought to deal with it, mm. because it goes to the heart of the government's policy. Well, I, I cannot see how it could be contemptuous of the democratic process to proceed on a course which is authorised on second reading on the principle by a very large majority of the House of Commons. This is the system under which we work, and I think Mr Powell prefers the House of Commons and elections to referenda. The House of Commons decided, and a very major decision, of course, it was that we should proceed to join the European community. This seems to me wholly democratic. At the time of the election, the issue of joining or not arguably unavoidably, was withheld from the electorate. They were told, and the vast majority of candidates were very emphatic in telling their electors of both parties, you are not voting on the principle of entering the common market or not. You're not being asked that. That will come later. But at that time, and in the words of a leader of a Conservative Party, it was perfectly clear that this was regarded as a step which was only imaginable with the full-hearted consent of Parliament and people, the famous words which rightly have never been disavowed. Then when the negotiations were concluded, and when following the negotiations, the entry was to be contrived on particular terms which had a specific effect upon Parliament, then the bill which embodied it was driven through Parliament by the strongest and final threat which is in the hands of any Prime Minister, namely to dissolve, and by the use of the guillotine in the House of Commons, and the public were informed that he didn't mean that they were to have a voice in it at all. The voice had been given by the House of Commons. Apparently. That's the point, Mr Maudling. Now, could you deal with those points? Yes, certainly. I don't accept Mr Powell's interpretation at all. At the election, we made it quite clear why we were not committed to join the community on any terms, we were going to negotiate with the purpose and intention of joining the community if we thought the terms were right. We thought the terms were right. It was then the duty of the government to put its choice, its policy, to the House of Commons. And the government, having made up its mind on a matter of fundamental principle, must say, if it's defeated, of course we dissolve. The government could not have continued as a government if defeated in the House of Commons in a matter of such fundamental importance. Would you say that the democracy of the decision was enhanced by the fact that the majority was not simply a government majority, but reinforced by a substantial number of opposition members, including Mr Roy Jenkins? I don't know. It's hard to say. I believe myself the democratic system means the majority in the House of Commons and bringing the fact that some of them were from the other side of the House. Well, that's an advantage, certainly, but I don't think it's a decisive change. And what about the way it was forced through the House of Commons? Forced through? Well, well it was that's carried what Mr. through. Powell, well, well, I know he uses a pejorative term. It was put through by the government because when a government has made a decision of what is right in the national interest, in their view, it is their duty to see it is carried through the House of Commons in the normal constitutional way, but, or, or put themselves at risk if they're beaten. Is it well, Reggie Maudling's view that this sort of decision, which of course must ultimately be put into effect by Parliament, a decision which fundamentally and in the end irreversibly alters the status of this country as a nation, and I think whatever our emphasis are, we would agree on that, is one which should be achieved in the way that so far it has been. Yes. Either way, the decision is fundamental, not necessarily retrievable, as Jenkins said, I think, last week. Either way, it is fundamental. The government's job, when faced with a fundamental choice, must be to put the policy it thinks the right one to the House of Commons and get either its support or its rejection. Can I invite yeah. Michael Foote and Roy Jenkins to give a brief comment on that argument? Michael Foote. Well, just on the question of the guillotine, let me give one or two practical examples of what forcing it through the House of Commons in that manner involved. It meant that we had a, an entirely truncated debate of about an hour and a half as to whether particular questions of food prices could be only operated if the House of Commons had given an affirmative approval of it. Or it uh, said we must uh, cut and curtail the debate as to whether members of Parliament should be sent to this Assembly in Parliament, which raises an absolutely first-class question of uh, uh, the relationship between our Parliament and another Parliament. But there are hundreds of such examples of how we sought to retain some powers 
for the House of Commons and they were swept away by the guillotine agreed by the Tories and the Liberals denying us the right to debate this matter fully. And as for what was said at the election, it wasn't merely that the matter didn't crop up. What was sought by Heath at the election was to keep the issue out of the election. That was the meaning of the word. We ask for the right to negotiate no more, no less. That is to say, we ask you at this election to give us the power to negotiate and thereafter, if we think the terms are suitable, to take you into the common market. That would have been a fair statement. That is not the statement that was made in the Conservative manifesto, in the election address of Heath or Maudling or any of them. They specifically specifically used words designed to keep the issue out of the last election and also the words saying can, can full-hearted consent for the British people that was designed to say of course we won't take you in without your full-hearted consent that also was designed to indicate to the British people that they would have another chance after the 1970 election to do it and from our can discussion I, I, last week Reginald Balding agrees that that was the very last chance that the British people ever had to say a word on this subject. Can, can I just... Uh, some of our listeners may be, uh, find difficulty in recollecting the precise atmosphere of the 1970 election, but, of course, the Labour government at that time was already negotiating for entry uh, and had started negotiating. And uh, why, therefore without commenting on what you say about what Mr Heath was doing, why therefore should it have been an election well, suit? The reason why Heath wanted to keep it out of the election was because he knew perfectly well it was very unpopular with the British people. Not quite as unpopular maybe as it is now after we've had several months of it, but he wanted to keep it out because he wanted to get votes. Roy Jenkins. The plain fact is that the present government, Mr Heath and the present government, did do a bit of pussyfooting on this issue at the time of the 1970 election, and to that extent the Prime Minister has been vulnerable and has had certain difficult words to explain away. Though, of course, there was at the time of the election a pretty clear Labour Party commitment too. However, what is undoubtedly the case is that there was in the present Parliament a substantial majority, a big majority on the vote of principle, um, for going in. And as those who are so far opposed to going in make such a great deal about the independent sovereignty of an untrammeled Parliament, I don't think they can easily laugh that way when it becomes rather inconvenient from their point of view. But quite point? honestly, if I may go on with this point, I've had a rather long period of silence. We are now, we, we are now <laughs> unusual, but um, striking. More now, striking for their gentlemen, reason. Gentlemen, let us keep it on a high level. <laughs> we are now nearly at the um, end of a long um, series of programmes um, extending over this summer about the politics of the 70s. And I'm bound to say, I rather hoped, and I think to some extent this has been true, that in discussing the politics of the 70s, we we're going to discuss the politics of the middle and the late 70s, and not all the time, discuss the politics of 1970, 1971, 1972. I'd rather like to look forward a little more, rather than look back, certainly at the end and the concluding part of this program. Well, we were, in fact, discussing the uh, philosophy of the Conservative Party and how this should, what this should stand for in, in the 70s, and, of course, it is up to those who want to define it to define it uh, as, they, as they see it. In the final few minutes of our program, uh, may I ask you this? We, the end of our program last Sunday, uh, I asked uh, Michael Foote and Roy Jenkins, indeed all of you, what they thought of the way Harold Wilson was leading the Labour Party. I want to ask Reginald Maudling and Enoch Powell as to how they think Edward Heath is leading the party, which is now in government. Mr Powell has already told us he thinks it is being led, and Mr Heath is the leader, it is being led to destruction. Uh, what do you think of Mr Heath as leader of the party, Mr Powell? Oh, well, that's uh, largely implicit in the words which you've... Uh, just repeat it. Uh, he, uh, he's not leading it to destruction out of levity or out of dishonesty or out of any mean motivation. But he is leading it to destruction because I believe he has never seen either politics or the Conservative Party in the terms of principles such that his present courses of government are a reversal and indeed a destruction of those principles. Uh, uh, as we said last week, there's an immense range of personalities. And I think the personality of the present Prime Minister is one in which, even as compared with uh, uh, an acknowledged pragmatist like Reggie Maudling, Pragmatism in the sense of what do we do now? 
isolating this problem from the total context and background is exceptionally strong. Did you uh, follow all that, uh, Mr. Maudling, and uh, what do you say about it? A little uh, complex. I, I really cannot accept that because Mr. Heath is leading the Conservative Party in government in ways of which Mr. Powell disapproves, he's necessarily leading it to destruction. I personally myself take exactly the opposite view. I think I've served under five Conservative Prime Ministers. I've known none with greater strength of character, greater determination to lead the government in the way which he thinks is right for the interests of the people of this country. That's a powerful tribute from a man who stood for the leadership against her. Mr. Heath, what is your response to that, Mr. Powell? I wouldn't dispute that, and it's entirely consistent with what I said. Mm -hmm. That he is a man of great character and determination. That's quite consistent with what he knows. Entirely. Mm -hmm. I've, I have no suggestion, it's never entered my mind, uh, that the Prime Minister has persuaded a course of action which he did not believe to be the right one and in the national interest. Therefore you have a great respect for him. But of course, I think there is a great mutual respect and fear. <laughs> Why do you fear Mr. Heath? Ah, uh, that's perhaps one-sided, rather. <laughs> you think he fears you? Yes. Why? Because I represent something in politics which is so foreign to his comprehension and to his scale of things and his picture of politics and of the world. What do you think that something is that you represent that he feared? Imagination. Mr. Maudling. Well, I've never known Mr. Heath be scared of anything or anyone. I don't think for a moment he's scared either of Mr. Powell or of his ideas. I think the only thing he might fear, as all of us I hope would fear, that we might, by some error or some failing on our own part, fail to do all that we might do for our country. He might fear that Mr. Powell might give his support to the Labour Party at the next election, don't you think? I don't think so. My, I'm sorry to have kept uh, Roy Jenkins and Michael Foot out of this for some time. As you see, I got slightly fascinated by Mr. Powell's uh, views at that point. Well, we're all fascinated by it. I, I think Heath is leading the Conservative Party to destruction, and I think it's the best thing that can be said for him. I think he's got the same uh, narrow self-righteousness, the same uh, resolute obstinacy as uh, Neville Chamberlain. I agree that the quality he most lacks is imagination, and he reveals that most in his utter misunderstanding of what the British people think and how they feel and how they look at things. I don't believe he has any kinship or sympathy with their feeling, and I believe that is the fact which is going to lead to his electoral defeat as well as the Conservatives. He did, he did have enough understanding to win the last election. Ah, he's a very good chief whip, but uh, once a chief whip always a chief whip and it's a very dangerous to have as a prime minister at such a critical moment in history a man who thinks in terms of a chief whip and whose imagination is so stunted by having uh, spent his time for example he was the chief whip at Suez and well, he saw how the Conservative Party can be manipulated then and he thinks they can be manipulated now that's a very dangerous state really, of affairs. Roy Jenkins already rebuked me for going back into too early in the 70s I don't want to go back into the 50s uh, your comment on Mr. Heath, uh, finally, Mr. Jenkins. Well, I've listened fascinated to Mr. Maudling attributing qualities to Mr. Heath, Mr. Powell attributing qualities to Mr. Powell, and um, the clash of um, view between um, these two and Mr. Foote's um, comment about it. I think Heath has some um, deficiencies. I think he leads the country in the wrong direction in a number of important ways. I think Mr. Powell would lead it in a still more wrong direction. I think Mr. Heath has um, certain gifts of determination, but I disagree with him quite profoundly on a number of matters of policy. But I think that in order to turn the country in a different direction, one has not merely to abuse Mr. Heath either as an individual or as a representative of something dark and reactionary, but does have to try and show in terms which are persuasive to the people as a whole what alternative approach to their needs and to their political desires one can make at the present time. And I hope very much that we in the Labour Party can do this over the coming year. Do you think that uh, the l lack of imagination with which uh, both Mr. Powell and Mr. Foote charge Mr. Heath is a, is a fair charge that you would go along with, or do, would you put it differently? 
Peggy has a certain flatness of personality which can be equated with a lack of, a lack of imagination. But although I disagree with him profoundly on a great number of issues, I don't think he is um, obsessed by the trivial, which is what I regard as the greatest sign of a lack of imagination. I think he tries to see what are the important issues and often arrives at a wrong decision about them. But I don't think he... Um, I, think, I don't think he mistakes trivial issues for big issues. Would you like to comment finally, Mr. Morton? Only to say I think he's a very fine Prime Minister and will continue to be one for a long time. Well, there we must end this discussion. Thank you, uh, Enoch Powell, Reginald Maudling, Roy Jenkins and Michael Foote. And that concludes this series on politics in the 70s. This is Robin Day saying good night. <laughs>